He's the co-host on Speak for Yourself with Marcellus Wiley, who also writes books. His is already a bestseller. It hasn't been released yet, but I know because he told me how many he sold, so it's guaranteed to be a bestseller. His name is Emmanuel Acho. Uh, three NFL seasons. Brother played as well. He was a first-team All-Big 12 linebacker at Texas. The book is Uncomfortable Conversations with a Black Man, Emmanuel Acho. And so uh, I watched your conversations with Roger Goodell and Matthew McConaughey, and we were saying something during the break. It's, it's, and it, I think John Lewis, the late John Lewis said this. It's a great line, and I've, I've thought about this before. In life, it's not what you say. It's, it's how it's heard. Exactly. And so when I watched your conversations— it wasn't what you always said, but as a white 55-year-old guy, it was how it landed for me. You weren't judgmental. I don't know if you wanted it to land that way, but I thought, oh, this stuff lands right. He's not preaching. He's not lecturing. He's telling me, hey, man, this is the way. And, and so that my, my first thing is a compliment into you have a way of making stuff land that is uncomfortable, yet I was never uncomfortable listening to it. That was the irony. I was it's like, oh, this is really, oh, this, I, I'm a curious guy. <laughs> so when you wrote the book, did you think you'd get, it was, it's been wholly embraced. Yeah. Did you think you'd get pushback? Um, you're always cognizant of potentially getting pushback, and that's why I'm very cognizant of every word I say and putting the right emphasis on the right syllable, right? Because you have to know exactly what you're saying and how you're saying it. You've said, and this is the second time I've heard it, Oprah actually, Colin, was the first person to say it, saying that I have a way of delivering hard information, but it doesn't come off as hard. Softly. I don't really know how I'm doing what I'm doing. Um, I'm just trying to deliver truth with grace and with love because I think that's what we need more of in this world is hard truths, but they have to be embodied and packaged with grace. Otherwise, they're too harsh for somebody to receive. You've used the line, guilt doesn't cause somebody to change. Love, love does. does. So being, you know, I tell my liberal friends this. Your message, your messaging's bad. You're being condescending. You can get along with conservatives. Don't always tell us how smart you are. So in your book, you never come across as preachy. It's like, listen, I'm going to tell you my life experience, and I, I want to talk about Oprah because people often ask me in my life, who's your role model? And I've said, Oprah. And they're like, not sports guys. I'm like, no, Howard Stern and Oprah own their own brands. That's the goal, yeah. to control it. Is Oprah um, obviously smart? But when after talking to Oprah, what's your takeaway on her vision and her? Um, it's funny because we, we did a Zoom call for an hour. Maybe it was two days ago. And the, the thing that sticks out with me most is the first question she asked me. I hop on a FaceTime after the first episode I did, Uncomfortable Conversations with a Black Man. It gets 25 million views in four days. And uh, I get a call from Oprah's assistant. She says, hey, Oprah wants to talk to you. The first question Oprah asked me, Colin, what is your intention? She said, what's your intention? Because your intention, it guides your direction. Right. And, and so when she asked me what my intention was, I said my intention is to change the world, be a bridge for racial reconciliation, and I think I can do that. The biggest thing when I talk to Oprah, which guides my direction of all my conversations, is, Emmanuel, what's your intention? And stay true to your intention. Don't worry about clicks. Don't worry about likes. Don't worry about follows. Don't worry about shares. Stay true to your intention and stay true to the messaging. I think that's what she does best. Yes. And that's what I borrow most uh, from her. Are you hopeful? That's a great question. Colin, I got an email from a 70-year-old woman named Lynn. It was after the first episode of Uncomfortable Conversations with a Black Man. She's a white woman, grew up in rural Alabama in the 1940s or 50s. She said, Emmanuel, I grew up, I didn't go to school with any quote-unquote Negroes. I grew up in rural Alabama, and I was very um, prejudiced, she says, in so many words. She said, but after watching your episode, I realized I can still change. Please don't give up on me yet. I love you, my son and my brother. Wow. Um, almost brought tears to my eyes, but it's nearly impossible not to be hopeful when you see something like that. What I realized, Colin, is there's great intentions. So black people and white people, we want to get along, but there's a fracture on how. There's a communication barrier, Colin. There's a communication color and culture disconnect, yeah. and that's the real problem at hand. Culture's fascinating because um, when I was growing up, there wasn't a black middle class. I think Bill Clinton's presidency was the first time I remember reading about a black middle class because of some legislative changes. Mm -hmm. And yet your life, from what I've read, you probably feel fortunate. I, f I feel I went through eight divorces as a kid, but I feel fortunate, right? Because I had a, a loving mother and a smart father. I want to talk about culturally. Yeah. Are we this dissimilar? 
you want to be loved and loved. You want to be successful. You, you, you want to realize your dreams. How dissimilar are we? You and me, black and white, are we really that dissimilar? There are cultural realizations, right? I would say it like this. Um, if you were to walk into the grocery store and you were to walk down the produce aisle, you would see a bunch of fruits. And they are all fruit. So they have that in common. But they have different shapes, different sizes, different tastes, different textures. And so while at our core, we all have our humanity in common. That's what I'm talking about. Yes. I, I understand the difference the between core, being white and black. I want to state that. I get that. But at our core. At our core, we're the same. But if the core is expressed differently, then we can never get to the core. You know what I mean? Like, Colin, that's, that's part of the problem is if we can never get to the core because of the exterior, the psychological differences, then we'll never get to the shared humanity. So when I ask that, I sound like a stupid old guy when I say, what are our differences? What I'm talking about is today, 2020, November, what is the day? 8th, 9th, 10th, 11th. I, I've always had this theory is that people, and I, we know the country's past, mm -hmm. but mostly Joy and I root for the same thing. We laugh at the same thing. We cry at the same stuff. And I think sometimes we do such a poor job, our media does a poor job, our politicians, um, that we're all, we're so powerful when we're unified. Absolutely. And we're so rarely unified. Yeah. It's, fr it's uh, frustrating to me. Politics makes me angry. I don't like being angry. I think... Uh, you get more. Uh, I, I see it, and it's just not a Trump thing. It's just a. It's just a political thing. Is that I? I think I'm. I get. I, I get off my phone sometimes. I am angry at our public figures using our divisiveness mm -hmm. because we, we, you know the, the, we see it. It, it. it. Does it frustrate you? It, it, it does. But this is a sports show, so let's talk sports. Why aren't we unified uh, in a locker room? People have different races. People have different religions. People yeah. have different orientations. But they're all unified, Colin, because they have the same common enemy. Therefore, they have the same common goal. Dallas Cowboys, common enemy. Philadelphia Eagles, let's go out there and win that game. The problem in our society, Colin, is we don't all have the same common enemy. See, people think that it's black versus white. It's man versus woman when it's really oppressed versus uh, oppressor. It's really hate versus evil. It's really, uh, it's really good versus evil, love versus hate. So when I think about the, the, the cause, when I think about the effect, Colin, I'm really looking at the cause. And what's the cause is we're not on the same page of what the common enemy is. So rather than you and I working together to defeat the enemy, you and I are bickering. And we can't defeat the enemy if we're bickering inside the locker room. Yeah. I know this is heady stuff and it's not real sportsy, but it's the stuff in this book that fascinates me. It's why I'm going to read it when I fly to Vegas today. This is the Vegas. This, listen, I talk sports all day. I don't get smart people that don't want to talk sports. Like, so when I get somebody, this is what it, all the pay, all the questions I was supposed to ask you at the end, I just moved up. <laughs> Cause that's, that's all the stuff. That's all the stuff that interests me. Nothing against the Colts Titans. Okay. We can talk about that all day long. <laughs> that, sure. It was kind of boring. I can't I don't lie. Get, I don't get your time because we're both busy, right? Yeah. And on COVID, we can't be around each other. So this is all the stuff that interests me. This is the stuff Joy and I talk about in the makeup room. We never talk sports. We talk about life and stuff, and this stuff to me is well. I, here's what here's what here's what I'll I think. Say. Your I think your book makes me think about race, and I don't get defensive, and mm -hmm. I don't get angry, and it, and I don't think many people deliver it like you, and that's why I think it's so important. I think it's so important. Your message, your message is obviously important, but the way you deliver it is very unique, and that and that's why I like you, and I like your stuff. Because you're striving for that. I don't want to sound like Oprah, but that's what you're striving for. A lot of people aren't honesty brokers in that space. Yeah. That's all I'll say. <laughs> Colin, my freshman year at the University of Texas, I'm coming from a private school, predominantly white. So the players I was playing with were undersized. I was typically the biggest. Now I'm going to the University of Texas. Had defensive coordinator at the time, Colin, Will Muschamp current head coach of South Carolina. He's known for punching a board so hard that the rebound of his fist cut his face in half. <laughs> like, that's Will Muschamp. And he said this the first day. He said, Acho, he said, listen to the message, not the tone. I was like, What's that even mean? He was so just verbally 
crazy yeah. that I had to try to pick apart what he was saying because yeah. the tone was too harsh. And I realized, ah, oh, that didn't necessarily work for me because some people can't just listen to the message and not the tone. So rather than making the reader do more work, Colin, I said, let me try to package the message in a softer tone as well. And that's what I did in Uncomfortable Conversations with a Black Man. And that's what I did in the book along with the show, because the people are at the table, Colin, ready to be delivered a meal. I just happen to be delivering the meal. I happen to be the chef of this, one of the chefs towards racial reconciliation, not the only. By the way, when you first did this, when you first, uh, the genesis of this, yeah. the day, the moment, the epiphany, when you're like, okay, I'm going to do it and I'm going to call it this. Where were you? What was at a drive? You wake up, you dream about it. Like, where did this all start? That, that is a question. Um, after the murder of George Floyd, I said, man, I have to do something. I said, I'm a sports analyst, but before I'm a sports analyst, Colin, I'm a black man. But before the world even saw me as a black man, I'm a human being. So it's my job to positively contribute to society, leave the world better than when I, for than when I got here. Colin, I originally was going to call it questions white people have. True story. I was going to call it questions white people have. I was going to get three black people at a table, three white people at a table. We'll sit at this round table, Colin. The white people will reach into the fishbowl, pull out a question. They will ask it. The black people will answer. But we're in the middle of COVID, so I couldn't get anybody together. <laughs> and so I said, uh-oh, I got to change this up. I said, timing is of the essence. You know that at sports. Everything is of the essence. I said, okay, I'll change the name to Uncomfortable Conversations with a Black Man. I'll do it myself. The first episode, I was supposed to do it with a friend. She had a change of heart. So I was never supposed to do the first episode by myself. First episode, Colin, I'm in an all-white room staring into the lens of a camera. Um, it was supposed to be uncomfortable conversations with a black man, not uncomfortable monologue with a black man. So why am I <laughs> sitting there by myself? I never wanted to be. And that's just how it came. I say there's a difference between your career and your calling. Career is what you're paid for. Calling is what you're made for. This, I found out, is my calling. It called me. I just happened to pick up. That's really well said. I'm not really interested in the sports questions. And I, and I say that respectfully. Um, are you worried about Brady and the Bucks? Oh, who the hell cares? <laughs> I mean, seriously, I just I can talk about that stuff with everybody else. I'm not I'm not really interested in that. Uh, uncomfortable conversations with a black man, Emmanuel Acho, is. By the way, I like that you didn't judge me because Twitter will. Yeah, I haven't been on it, but I you know, that you didn't judge me. You didn't even look at me harshly when I said, "How dissimilar are you?" Because if you said that on Twitter, I would be ravaged. But you See, didn't judge me when I said, you know, how dissimilar are we? The initial take, like a minute later, I'm not smart enough to get it in real time. A minute later, I'm like, oh, that sounded stupid. <laughs> but you didn't judge me on that. Colin, the problem in our society, I would say one of the top three biggest problems, I'll probably put it at third, cancel culture. When somebody says something, we're so ready to cancel them that we don't give them the room or the opportunity to grow. What does that do? Not only does it not allow the person the opportunity to grow, but it makes them fearful or more timid the next time. That we talked about this with Drew Brees. Drew Brees had earned the right to a to what's viewed by many as a mistake. Mm -hmm. He'd given to charity. He'd been a wonderful teammate. Gerald McCoy came on the show and he's like, I faced him in Tampa. He was my mentor. He, to me, he had earned the right yeah. his, to make in the eyes of his clubhouse or his locker room a mistake. And I, the cancel culture, which by the way, I think it's a little overstated. I think it's been here forever. People yeah. have been trying to cancel me for 30 years. <laughs> so this idea that like, in the 70s and 80s, I had opinions and everybody liked me, but I do think social media has amplified the force in which it's delivered and the urgency in which it's delivered. Absolutely. It's, it's an avalanche. Yeah. And, and that is why I think so many people are afraid to say something about anything because they don't want to be canceled. Colin, growing up, I used to play the game Minesweeper. Remember on your computer, it's right under solitaire, like right under hearts. I never knew how to play it, but I was bored on an airplane, so I would play Minesweeper. Colin... The objective of the game is to just kind of keep clicking around and hopefully you don't land on a mine. Yeah. And that's what I think we do in society now is like we're so fearful of landing on a mine with every word that we say that we don't even bother playing the game, except it's not really a game. It's something called life. And because so, people are so often afraid of clicking a verbal mine and saying the wrong thing, it's oh like, boy. Oh, I'm just not going to say anything no, at all. This is a, listen, this is something very real. This is, this is why 22% of America is on Twitter and 78 not. Yeah. They're, it's not because they're not interested, but or they sign up and they don't talk on it because this is the world we live and in. And that, Colin, is why I wrote the book, because I wanted to preemptively answer questions that people don't want to ask because they don't want to get canceled. An ounce of prevention is better than a pound of cure. So let me try to preemptively and proactively answer questions for people who want them, who want to ask them, but might be a little bit afraid to. This is great. You know, sports is okay. This is way better.
So the book is Uncomfortable Conversations with a Black Man Emanuel Acho. There's a great picture on the back. You, 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 know, you know how some people just look good in a suit? I mean, seriously. Right. I mean, no, I mean, honestly. Some guys look great. It's in actually suit. the Fox billboard picture. Is it really? Shout out to Fox. Yeah. You didn't even pay for the suit. That's even better. <laughs> Free suit is better than whatever, Colin. <laughs> Hey, congrats on your success. <laughs> Thank you, my friend. Thank you so much for taking time for us. Pleasure's mine. Hi, everybody. Thanks for watching. Subscribe here to get the latest from the show. Also, be sure to check out more of the best clips from The Herd or go watch a few segments from other shows on FS1.